Hi, everyone. My name is Gabriella Tora. I am the Agriculture and Natural Resources Agent for UGA Extension in Fulton County. And today I'm going to be talking about insect allies, predators, and parasitoids in the garden. So I want to thank the North Fulton Master Gardeners for having me as part of the Spring Virtual Gardening Lecture Series. Just a few housekeeping points. Um, this talk is going to be recorded. It is being recorded currently, and it'll be posted to YouTube after um, our talk ends, so you can view it later if you like. If you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A. You can find that at the bottom of your screen, the button that says Q&A, and we will answer them at the end of the talk. So let's get into it. All right, so I am an entomologist by training. Um, I, this is my favorite topic to talk about. Uh, my background is in agricultural entomology, and I did a little bit of work in museum collections as well, but I had such transformative experiences on farms, in greenhouses, in the lab, um, working with food and seeing all the insects that are out there interacting with plants. So something that brought me to extension is that I wanted to bring people closer to where their food came from. Um, and so to sort of close the gap between people and their food. In my spare time, I'm a bird birder, a gardener, uh, mostly of culinary herbs and flowers for my pollinators. I consider myself a home chef um, and a baker. And as your extension agent, um, I wear a lot of hats, but probably the biggest responsibility is developing educational programs for Fulton County's residents, our commercial agricultural producers like farmers, nurseries, and pretty much anybody that lives or works in Fulton. Um, I want to deliver programming around agriculture and natural resources for them. So we also consult with clients individually, whether they are residential clients. So somebody might call into the office and say, my house plant is dying, what's going on? Or um, I wanna plant a native plant garden, where do I start? We also consult with commercial producers um, like these farmers, nurseries, et cetera, about stuff that's going on um, in their landscapes as well. Along with my other ANR team members, we coordinate master, the Fulton County Master Gardener Extension Volunteer Program of which the North Fulton Master Gardeners participate. And in general, your extension agents are the tip of the spear, so to speak, of the entire UGA extension system. So our job is to take all the knowledge and information that is created at the university and translate that and deliver it to the residents of the county. So we are educators in nature. So I already introduced myself. Next, we're going to talk about what natural enemies are and why you should care about them. Then we're going to meet some of the common predators and parasitoids that you might see in your garden so you know who's who next time you go out there. And then hopefully by that point in the presentation, I will have convinced you that natural enemies are important and they're awesome and you will want to conserve them. So we'll talk about ways that you can do that. So when we use this term natural enemies, we're talking about insects that are at the top of the food chain. So insects that control or suppress other insects that are lower down the food chain. Um, and there's a couple buckets that we can put them in sort of based around their lifestyles. One of those buckets are predators. So these are insects that capture and eat other insects, which we refer to as the prey. So a praying mantis is a good example of a predator. They're actually generalist predators. So they eat lots of different types of insects and even other natural enemies. Um, then we've got parasitoids. You might not be familiar with this term, but it's an insect that completes its life cycle and its development either on or inside of another insect, which we refer to as the host. And in this process of the parasitoids, development or it completing its life cycle, the host insect usually dies. So something we have a lot of parasitoid wasps, which we'll talk about later. This one, this poor aphid was probably its host. Um, and we've got tomato hornworms are a great example. We'll talk about those later too. 
We have this other category of parasites, and they're, you are probably familiar with this term. They're similar to parasitoids in that they complete some of their development on or inside of another insect and live at the expense of this host insect. But the big difference is that the host does usually does not die in the process. There aren't a ton of examples of insect parasites in our landscapes. Um, so I'm not really gonna talk about this category, um, but just so you know, that's sort of the big difference. So, oh, and I wanted to mention that natural enemies are important because they keep nature in balance by suppressing um, insects that are lower down the food chain, they're keeping some of those herbivorous insects, which are typically our pests in the landscape, um, they're keeping them suppressed so they're not causing more problems. So a good example of this type of relationship would be wolves in North America. Wolves, we know, are top predators. They eat stuff like white-tailed deer. And so in our history in North America, when we eradicated wolves, we ended up having tons of issues with white-tailed deer. I'm sure everybody has their own deer experiences. Um, and it's the same in the insect world. When we get rid of our predators, we have issues with our herbivorous insects, which are typically our pests. So now we're just going to go through some of the common insect predators and parasitoids that you might see in your garden. Wasps, I put first in this presentation because I think that they are probably the most important. And you might be having an emotional reaction to seeing these wasps on screen or to talking about wasps, and I completely get that. Um, but they are amazing predators and parasitoids, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so we have to talk about them first because they're, they're really awesome when you get to know what their lifestyles are like. So we have a couple categories, again, based on these insects' lifestyles. So the first category is social wasps. These are insects that live in big family groups or colonies. That's where all of their relatives live. That's where all of their offspring live. And they have sort of a big mission to defend this colony. So they can be kind of aggressive when disturbed. And these are species like paper wasps, bald-faced hornets, and yellow jackets that a lot of times build their nests or their colonies on our houses, near our houses. And that paired with the fact that they can be aggressive when defending their colonies sometimes makes them pests to us. But they are predators. They're out there collecting mostly caterpillars um, to feed to their larvae that are housed inside the colony. And we'll talk about this later too. They are also really important pollinators in the landscape. So then we've got solitary wasps. They do not live in big colonies. They live alone. And they're rarely aggressive. The females will build one or a few small nests out of a variety of materials. So the female might collect a bunch of mud and build a little pot like this. Um, this is a mud daubing wasp. There are lots of different species of those. The female might dig a hole in some bare ground where she's gonna lay one or a few eggs and, and feed those larvae over time. Um, they might nest in some woody stems that have sort of an empty cavity under logs or brush piles, all types of natural materials they will use to build their nests. And so you can think of solitary wasp females kind of like single moms. Um, they have just one or a few larvae that they're taking care of at a time. They don't have this big colony to defend. And because of that, they're not going to risk stinging you. Um, and potentially getting swatted and killed because it's only them. They have to take care of their offspring to ensure that they can grow up to adulthood. Um, so because of that, they're rarely aggressive and there are far more species of solitary wasps in your landscape than there are social wasps. So that's just something to keep in mind. Then we've got our parasitoid wasps. They're kind of a subset of solitary wasps. Most parasitoid wasps do live a solitary lifestyle, but like I talked about, they will lay their, the females will lay their eggs in or on another insect. 
the larva hatches either inside that host insect or on the outside of it. And it feeds on that host. Um, that's its primary food source. So it can develop through all its larval stages. It can pupate and um, emerge as an adult. So a great example of this is the tomato hornworm. You might have seen this in your garden. If you have, that's awesome. And if you haven't, keep an eye out. You might see it, it's very common. But the tomato hornworm, as we know, is a pretty serious pest of our tomatoes. One of these big boys can take out like an entire tomato plant in an afternoon. Um, they are voracious feeders. And they have a couple different parasitoid wasps that actually parasitize them. So wasps in the genus Trichogramma will parasitize the tomato hornworm egg. So you can see this female is laying her egg in the tomato hornworm egg. So when the wasp larva hatches inside of here and it starts feeding, that's to the detriment of this egg. This egg will never hatch into a caterpillar. So if we're growing tomatoes, we like to see that. That keeps us from having to spray pesticides or pick these off and throw them in the woods or whatever. They also have another species called Cotesia congregata that is a larval parasitoid. So this female will lay her eggs actually inside of the body of the tomato hornworm. Again, the larvae, the wasp larvae are inside feeding, feeding, feeding until they're ready to pupate. They sort of burrow out and they create, where's my pointer? They create these little cocoons, just like a butterfly or a moth creates a cocoon where they're going to pupate and emerge as an adult. Wasps do the same thing. So each one of these little cocoons has a wasp pupa of this species, Cotesia. And then when they are ready to emerge as an adult, they kind of pop the tops off. Like maybe you can see all the little tops are popped off and they fly away. So if you see this in your garden, just leave it alone. <laughs> we wanna ensure that we have these little parasitoid wasps in the landscape. And you know, fortunately or unfortunately, this tomato hornworm doesn't really have much time left. It's not really gonna be feeding that much at this time anyway. So there, there are so many species of parasitoid wasps. Um, even in our landscape and around the world. And they have lots of different sizes and shapes. Um, so actually the smallest insect that we know of is a parasitoid wasp. It's in the family that we call fairy flies. This is not a picture of that species. I couldn't get a good picture of our smallest insect we know of because it's 186 micrometers long. You have to look at it under a microscope. Um, but it is a parasitoid of bark lice eggs, I think. So anyway, we have tons of really, really tiny parasitoid wasps, and they also get pretty big. So this is our giant ichneumon wasp, and this female uses her ovipositor, which I'm pointing to. This is the insect's egg-laying organ, and she actually uses that to drill through the bark of this tree and she lays her egg inside of the larva of another wasp that is tunneling under the bark of this tree and could potentially be a tree pest. So these parasitoids have evolved over millions of years with their hosts. So they're highly specialized to only parasitize either one species of host insect or a small group of hosts. Um, so they pose no threat whatsoever to humans. They're not interested in us at all. They are just trying to find that one species of host. And so they, they help us control um, these insects that are often pests to us. Lady beetles, well, beetles in general are the most species group of insects, meaning there are more species of beetles than any other type of insect. And actually, you can see in this pie chart, there are more species of beetles that we know of than of all plants and algae. And that's just beetles, that's not all insects. So there are a ton of beetles. Um, they're out there in your landscape. We have amazing beetle diversity. So the first group we're gonna talk about are lady beetles. Most of them are predators, not all, um, but they have lots of different colors and shapes sort of. 
most of them are this sort of bulbous round shape, but they do have lots of colors. They're not always this red with black spots. Um, they might be orange, pink, black, um, sort of in that range. And they range from about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch wide. But again, there's huge diversity in this group. Um, the larvae, you can see a picture of the larva here. Some people say they look like little alligators, which I like. They're kind of blue, black, grayish, and usually have a couple yellow or orange spots on them. Super common in the landscape. Once you know what they look like, you're going to see them everywhere. And you can see this one is feeding on some aphids, which we love to see. Um, of our predatory lady beetles, both adults and larvae are predators. And in general, um, they will feed on lots of different types of insects. Um, so some species you might see in your landscape are the multicolored Asian lady beetle. Is that what we're looking at here? No, this is the seven spotted lady beetle. This is actually a species from Europe, but it has naturalized in America. So it'll feed on lots of different stuff, mostly soft bodied insects like aphids, white flies, mealybugs, that, that type of thing. Um, but pretty much whatever they can get their hands on. We've got convergent lady beetles. This is um, a North American native species. The multicolored Asian lady beetle. This is an introduced species from Asia. Um, these are the guys that aggregate and they'll come into your house in the winter, but they are generalist predators in our landscapes. I can't say for sure that they've naturalized in the US at this point, but they're really widespread. Um, so they are taking care of pests in our gardens. We've got the spotted lady beetle or pink spotted lady beetle. And I don't know if this picture really does it justice, but they're like hot pink. I saw a lot of these last year in um, my wildflower garden and in my pumpkin patch. So they're out there. This one is feeding on some Colorado potato beetle eggs. So if anybody <laughs> has had some experience with Colorado potato beetles, they can be a really serious pest. Um, so we like to see that our, our predators are feeding on these eggs so they never even hatch. We've got the spider mite destroyer. This is a tiny lady beetle that's black and it's got some little hairy patches all over it. And it mostly eats mites spider mites in particular, which we know can be serious pets of both our house plants and of our landscape plants. So there's a lot of diversity in colors and shapes and sizes of lady beetles. We also have ground beetles, like their name suggests, they're mostly on the ground. They're rooting around under leaf litter, under twigs, under logs, in the thatch layer of your turf grass. Um, usually they're feeding at night but they feed on ground dwelling pests. So stuff like fall army worms, um, small mole crickets. Um, what else? Other caterpillars that might be on the ground, um, cutworms, things like that, that we consider turf grass pests. Our ground beetles are taking care of some of those for us. They tend to be bigger than uh, lady beetles. So they're about a quarter of an inch to an inch long. Again, a ton of diversity in this group. Um, but in general, they're kind of, they have this elongated look, and I think they look really tough. They have to be really fortified and tough if they're going to be crawling around under twigs and logs and in thatch and stuff. So a couple species you might see around here are Say's caterpillar hunter, and like their name suggests, they mostly feed on caterpillars, but they also will eat grubs, which are larvae of other beetles. So white grubs like Japanese beetle grubs, they will feed on them. We've got Poselis chalcedes, which does not have a common name. It's just Poselis chalcedes, but it's feeding on similar stuff, caterpillars, um, turf grass dwelling pests. Um, but this guy will also eat weed seeds. So it's an herbivore, but it's gonna be taking care of some weed seeds for us as well. And just like our lady beetles, both the adults and the larvae of these carabid beetles are predators. Then we've got true bugs. These are bugs in the order Hemiptera. And this also is a huge, super diverse group um, that includes some of our worst pests, actually. Stuff like white flies, aphids, scale insects, 
mealybugs, stink bugs, and more are all considered true bugs, but there are a lot of true bug predators out there as well. So what all of these insects have in common, whether they're pests or predators, is that they have what we call piercing sucking mouth parts. So what that means is their mouth is shaped like a needle and it's really sharp and they'll use it to pierce whatever they, they feed on. So if it's an herbivorous true bug, they're using that needle to pierce leaves and suck out the cell contents and that's what they feed on. If they're a predator, they're using that needle-like mouth part to pierce their prey and suck out their body, bodily juices, I guess. <laughs> um, so some true bug predators you might see here in Georgia are the spined soldier bug. This is actually um, a predatory stink bug. So not all stink bugs are bad. Some of them are taking care of our pests for us. And you can tell that this is the spine soldier bug because it's got these pointy shoulders. Like it kind of, they look like 80 shoulder pads to me. Um, but this is a, a fairly large insect. And so they're feeding on other large stuff like our beetle grubs and caterpillars. We've got assassin bugs. This one is feeding on a corn rootworm, which is a, a leaf beetle. Um, and they'll feed on other stuff like aphids, leaf hoppers, caterpillars, and Japanese beetle grubs also. The minute pirate bug, this is really common. They'll sometimes jump on me when I'm walking through my garden and like give me a little pinch. I don't know, I don't know what their game is there, but they're pretty small, so they feed on other small stuff, usually soft-bodied insects like aphids small army worms if they can get to them, um, thrips, spider mites, things like that. This one is feeding on some kind of egg of another insect. And you can see its, ne its needle-like mouth part right here is piercing this egg. We've got big-eyed bugs. They're also very small, but they have really big eyes. I don't know how, if you can see this photo super well, but they're kind of funny looking. And they also will eat small, soft-bodied stuff. This one is actually feeding on another true bug, probably one that was chewing on your plants. So believe it or not, we have a lot of fly predators and parasitoids as well. Our hoverflies and flower flies, which are in the family Surfidae, so some people call them surfid flies as well. You might know these as pollinators. We talk about them a lot when we're talking about native pollinators. And we'll talk later, there's a lot of crossover between our natural enemies and our pollinators. Um, but they get this name of hoverflies because th their flight pattern kind of looks like a hummingbird. They'll hover in flight when they're moving between flowers and between leaves. They're small, so they'll eat other small stuff, um, especially aphids. They're, they're voracious aphid feeders. And a lot of them actually mimic wasps and bees in their morphology or the way that they look. So you can kind of see these look like little bees or wasps and that's kind of to fool other insects into thinking that they're tougher than they really are maybe. Then we've got robber flies. A lot of folks confuse robber flies with um, horse flies or deer flies because they're really big and they're really loud when they're flying around. Um, but they actually look quite different. So they have this sort of elongated abdomen, whereas horse flies and deer flies are more round. Um, and they have these long legs that they use to actually capture prey in flight. So they have amazing big eyes for, they have amazing eyesight because of their big eyes. And so they're incredible aerial hunters. And we consider these guys to be top predators. So they'll eat pretty much anything, including other predators and our beneficials, but that's okay because we want a, di a diverse assemblage of natural enemies in our garden. So we want insects at every level of the food chain. Long-legged flies, they are really small and really slight looking. And so you might not think that they would be predators, but they are. They also feed on small stuff like aphids. And they're like metallic greenish blue. So they really shine in the sunlight and you'll often see them perched on leaf surfaces like this. So keep an eye out for them. Um, they have this sort of long and skinny abdomen and really long legs, of course. 
Then we've got tachinid flies. These are in the family tachinidae, so we call them tachinid flies. And I think they kind of just look like house flies, like they're kind of stout and hairy. And but there's a lot of diversity in this group as well. And they are actually parasitoids. They're not predators. Um, they have different species have different strategies for parasitizing their hosts, which include things like caterpillars, beetle grubs, earwigs, grasshoppers, and all types of true bugs. But some species actually will lay their egg on leaf material where they know a caterpillar is feeding. So the caterpillar will actually consume their egg and that egg can start to develop inside the body of the caterpillar. Some species will glue their egg onto the outside of the host insect and others will lay their eggs sort of on the host, just like we saw with the parasitoid wasps. So they have lots of cool strategies for par parasitizing their target host. Um, the adults mostly feed on pollen and nectar. So again, they're valuable pollinators for us. We've got lace wings, which I think are absolutely beautiful. Um, if you ever see lace wings around, they're sort of gentle and they fly like little fairies, I think. They have these big, beautiful see-through netted wings. We have two big categories of lace wings here in Georgia. We've got green lace wings and we've got brown lace wings. That's their official names and that's what color they are. So you can easily tell the difference. Um, but it's really the larvae, which you can see in this photo on the bottom, they are the powerhouse predators. The adults mostly feed on nectar and pollen, but the larvae will feed on all types of stuff. This one, it looks like is feeding on a white fly nymph. So we know white flies can be a, a big problem, but they'll eat lots of different stuff. And they also kind of have this little alligator look like our lady beetles. Lace wings have really distinctive eggs. So if you've never seen these in your garden, you probably will after this talk now that you know what they look like. And they're distinctive because they're at the ends of these long stalks. And I, whenever I'm giving this kind of talk um, to a group, I like to ask people, why do you think they're, they're on these long stalks? But for the sake of time, I'm just gonna tell you, it's to keep other predators from eating these eggs. So we know just from talking about the groups that we've already gone over that a lot of these predators and parasitoids are targeting insect eggs. So by having them on these long sort of skinny stalks, predators can't get to them. So if you see these in your garden, please leave them alone. They are for our lovely lace wings. This is my catch all slide. Um, we've got mantids. We have several different species of mantids here in Georgia. And just like our robber flies, mantids are top predators. So they will feed on a wide variety of different insects. Um, they're ambush predators. So they'll sort of camouflage and be really still on, on a plant or on a twig until their unsuspecting prey gets close enough and they can use those powerful forelegs to reach out and grab them. So this one we can see is feeding on a grasshopper. If you live near a body of water, or maybe you have a pond in your landscape, you might also see dragonflies and damselflies. They actually complete part of their life cycle in the water. So that's why we see them around bodies of water. And they are amazing flyers as well. They have really large sensitive eyes and they can move all four wings independently. So they have amazing control over their flight and that makes them great aerial predators. They love mosquitoes. Obviously there's gonna be a lot of mosquitoes also near bodies of water. So they've earned the nickname mosquito hawks. Then we've got spiders. You might be saying, hold up, hold up. Spiders are not insects, which you're right. They are arachnids, but they're out in our landscapes and they're doing some of this natural enemy behavior. So I wanted to highlight them. And like some of our insects, they have diverse lifestyles and strategies for catching their prey. So up at the top, this is a green link spider. 
Like our mantids, they're ambush predators. So they stay camouflaged. You can tell they're green and they've got sort of these little hairs. So they blend into flowers and blend into leaves and they just stay really still until an unsuspecting prey insect gets close enough to be grabbed or snatched um, by the green lynx. We've got jumping spiders, objectively the cutest spiders, but they use these powerful legs to pounce on their prey. And then we've got the garden spider, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with garden spiders. Um, they are web spinners. So they build these really big tensile webs that have this characteristic zipper pattern. And so they're gonna catch mostly um, flying insects as their prey. And that was just honestly a taste of all the diversity of insects that you would see in your garden. There are many more groups of insects that um, are considered natural enemies, but for the sake of time, those are probably my favorites and the most important. So that's what, what I wanted to highlight. So at this point, you might be like totally freaked out, <laughs> tired of seeing insects. And you're like, I had no idea that all of these insects were out in my landscape doing all this crazy stuff. So you know what, that's fine. I hope though, that you're seeing that there is a lot going on in your garden and that these insects are taking care of our lo a lot of our pest insects. So you can just sit on your porch drinking coffee. You don't have to be out there picking individual insects because if we have a diverse assemblage of our natural enemies, they're doing some of that for us. So hopefully you're in that camp. If you are, we're gonna go ahead and talk about ways that you can conserve natural enemies in your landscape. So you don't have to do so much work controlling pests. So when we're thinking about conserving natural enemies, we want to think about, well, what do they need in the landscape? And all animals, yes, PSA, insects are animals. Um, all insects, all animals need some basic things for survival, and that is food, water, shelter. Our natural enemies are need those things as well. So we can help with that um, in managing our landscapes. And so in terms of food, the first thing they need is prey. So what that means is that we should not be trying to completely nuke all insects in our gardens. We need to allow low levels of prey populations to exist in order to be food sources for our natural enemies. And you know what, that level is whatever is acceptable to you in your garden. Um, but when we have these natural enemies in place, our prey populations are never gonna get out of control. So just know that it's healthy in our garden ecosystems to have low levels of prey. Our natural enemies are also feeding on pollen and nectar, and that's where our flowering plants are really helpful. So they use pollen and nectar sort of as alternative food sources when prey is scarce, or if they just need a snack when they're out hunting. So pollen is really high in protein. Nectar is really high in carbohydrates. So you can think of these flower resources like Red Bull for bugs, especially our wasps that are big and powerful and they're carrying big stuff like caterpillars back to their nests. They need that quick boost of energy. So if we can provide flower resources in our gardens by planting flowering plants, then that is really helpful for our natural enemies. So the goal is to have flower resources in the landscape for as close to year round as possible. So we wanna plant a diverse group of flowering plants that flower at different times of year. And so we can plant stuff that's really early spring bloomers like forsythia, things that bloom later in the spring like red hot poker or bottle brush. Um, we wanna plant things that bloom in the summer like zinnias or our cone flowers, which are echinacea and rubecchias. We wanna plant fall blooming stuff. Goldenrod is a classic fall bloomer um, and things like asters, like New England aster. And please don't forget that trees and shrubs are amazing floral resources for our insects as well. Um, we wanna aim for native plants if possible. Um, they're easier for you to maintain in your landscape because they're more suited to our climate. 
And there's some evidence that they are more nutritious for our native pollinators and natural enemies. So if you can find native options for your garden, that is gonna be more helpful for our insects. But of course, non-native species, there are a lot out there that are also providing um, great pollen and nectar resources for our natural enemies. Something we don't think about a lot is water. You know, animals need water. All life on earth needs water. So if you already have a bird bath in your, in your landscape, you can just plop a rock in there to create sort of a shallow area where insects can easily access the water like these honeybees are doing. It's helpful to leave some rocks in the landscape or patches of bare ground where water can collect, you know, little puddles and crevices where insects can access water. Maybe you've seen butterflies, which are not natural enemies, but maybe you've seen them sort of aggregating on a rock or a patch of mud, sucking up water and, and um, salt. Then shelter is a big one. Our insects um, use natural materials in the landscape for a lot of different reasons. They use them to get out of the elements, um, to hide from our you know, top predators like mantids and robber flies. They use them to mate and to reproduce, to build their nests, among other activities. So we want to try and provide as diverse a group of natural materials in our landscapes as we are able to. So some easy ways to do that are to leave your woody stems in the garden. So we want to sort of chop them off so that these cavities are open and then wait to clean them up until the spring. And so things like our solitary wasps will actually lay one or a few eggs in these stems that overwinter and then will develop as adults um, in the spring. So these are really helpful. Log and brush piles are helpful as well. When they start to decompose, they actually re release heat. Um, and so that creates like a little warm microclimate for our natural enemies. If you have a space where you can leave the leaves, you know, your fallen leaves from your trees, that's really helpful too. It doesn't have to cover your entire landscape, but if you can leave like a leaf pile over in the corner somewhere where it doesn't bother you, um, then that's a great resource as well. Leaving bare ground is great um, for our ground nesting natural enemies. And leaving rocks and places where insects can get sun is really helpful. Sometimes we forget that they are cold-blooded animals, and so they need to actually absorb sunlight and heat before they can start going about their foraging and parasitizing activities that help us. So leaving rocks or like pavers are great in the landscape. There are areas where things like ground beetles, which we can see right here, can get some sun and warm up. You might recognize what this is. This is an insect hotel or a bee hotel, and you're basically providing a bunch of cavities in a small space um, for bees as well as wasps, which are our natural enemies. Um, it's great to provide these in the landscape. I think the jury's out a little bit because there are a few issues. Um, one is that you're packing a lot of individual insects in a small area that wouldn't necessarily be in a small area. And so that can cause some disease issues. It also creates sort of a buffet for our top predators, like a mantid who might be hanging out there getting an easy snack off of our insects. So it's great to provide these types of materials. I would encourage you to have a diverse set of natural materials so that our natural enemies can take advantage of lots of different resources. And then there's this last idea of structural complexity. And what that means is that you have a lot of different heights, depths, textures to the natural materials in your landscape. And that supports more diverse insect communities, which includes our natural enemies. So I put this picture here because I think this is a very structurally complex landscape. We've got big overstory trees. We've got some understory trees. We've got woody shrubs. There's some smaller herbaceous plants. There's some flowering plants at different heights and we have a ground cover. So that provides a lot of different places where our 
predators and parasitoids can complete their lives. So you might know that you can purchase a lot of natural enemies commercially, like on Amazon. Um, some popular commercially available natural enemies are lady beetles and lace wings. Um, there are lots more that you can buy online. This is not a super sustainable way to introduce uh, natural enemies into your landscape. For one, they've been reared in a lab, so they're not really habituated to your landscape. So when you release them, they might not survive. Um, a lot of them might not survive or they might disperse. The other thing is there's usually not enough prey to support as many natural enemies as you're releasing, which is usually like a hundred or a couple hundred. There's just not enough food in the landscape for them. So a lot of them are gonna end up flying away and you just wasted your time and money. A more sustainable option is actually to attract and retain our native natural enemies by having a great landscape for them, by giving them these resources like food, water, and shelter that they need to survive. And then you're keeping them there in that area so they can provide these pest management services to you. So that's pretty much all that I have. Um, I hope that was just a taste of all of the cool things that insects are out there doing in your garden. And I challenge you to go out and observe them in the garden. Keep an open mind to all the cool things that insects are doing, their habits, their lifestyles. Um, and remember that they're out there controlling some of your worst garden pests. So if anybody came into this talk, like wanting to nuke all the insects in their garden, I hope that I, at least um, if, if I didn't completely change your mind, then I at least introduced a seed of an idea that there are insects doing cool stuff out there. So I want to thank all of our promotional partners that helped get the word out about um, this lecture series, as well as our media partners that have helped share um, our registration link and get the word out. We do have two more talks coming up in this series on the um, consecutive Sundays. So Ferns of the Southeast is gonna be next Sunday. And then we've got annual and perennial plants for water gardens on Sunday, April 2nd. In the extension office, we get a ton of questions about water gardens. That's kind of a hot topic right now. So if that's something you're interested in, please tune in. You can go to one of these links to uh, register for these classes or just go to the North Fulton Master Gardeners website. There's an easy link there where you can register for these webinars. We also have a huge social media presence. So please check out one of um, the North Fulton Master Gardeners social media channels to see uh, what we're up to and all of the cool horticultural programming that's happening. You can support the work of the North Fulton Master Gardeners um, by donating through one of these avenues. There's more information on the website about this as well. We have a Giving Garden online plant sale coming up as well. This is a completely online sale where you can purchase plants or bulbs. So definitely check that out. Um, this helps the North Fulton Master Gardeners as well. Our celebration garden tour is coming up. You can actually tour five home gardens of the North Fulton Master Gardeners in the Sandy Springs area. Um, click this QR code or go onto the website to learn more info, to get more information about that. That's happening um, on June 3rd. And we have our annual garden fair is coming up at the Grove at Wills Park in Alpharetta. That's happening on Saturday, April 29th. That's going to be a great event with vendors, um, activities for kids. There will be an Ask a Master Gardener booth in case you have questions you want to pitch to the Master Gardeners, all types of fun stuff happening there. I put some resources here if you are interested in learning more about this topic. Um, most of these are online resources, but this is a great book that we have in the Extension Office called Garden Insects of North America. This has like every insect that you're going to see is in this book. And a lot of the photos in this presentation actually came from this book. So um, a lot of other cool extension pubs if you're interested. And that's pretty much all I got. 
Dana is going to help me out with some questions. And so I would love to hear um, what you all want to learn more about. So thank you very much. Thanks, G Gabrielle. It was awesome. Um, we do have a number of questions, actually. Um, okay. First is, what would you suggest for getting rid of red fi or fire ants that are in a pile of dirt that we bought for landscaping? OK, fire ants, yes. Um, fire ants are tough to get rid of. We have some extension recommendations online, um, but it really has to be a multi-pronged approach. So I would recommend treating individual mounds with granular insecticides. Of course, you wanna follow all the instructions that are on the label. And if you're treating the same area multiple times, you wanna rotate different insecticides, the active ingredients. Granular are really good. You wanna apply them at the rate that's on the label and then water them in. You might have to do this a couple times and the insects will disperse and create a new nest. So you really have to hit that like multiple times. Um, I don't really recommend pouring anything into the mound. Like, I don't know, some people will pour hot water or pour other things. If you really have a problem with fire ants, go with the insecticide route. And of course, follow all the instructions on the label. Thank you. Um, is nematoid root knot a parasite? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, yes. Root knot nematodes are parasites. Um, let me let me think about that. Um, root knot nematodes actually, so they're parasites on the plant, um, and they sort of, we sort of consider them to be disease pathogens because they they cause a disease in the plant or changes to the plant morphology. So you'll see those root knots because of the nematodes have been feeding on the plant. That may or may not kill the plant. So I think that, that would, they would be considered parasites. Um, they're gonna produce severe stunting in your plant. So if anybody has um, experience with root knot nematode in your landscape, especially if you're growing vegetables, the thing to do about nematodes is to rotate your crops. Don't plant plants that are susceptible to root knot nematode in the same spot every year. You wanna have a rotation of at least two years off with non-susceptible species in that exact area. And that will really help suppress nematodes. Thank you. Um, are there any predators of Mexican bean beetles? Yes. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head. There may or may not be some, um, some parasitoids that specialize on Mexican bean beetle, but certainly a lot of our um, generalist predators would go after them. Like potentially, you know, some of our larvae, like lacewing larvae, lady, be lady beetle larvae will, will go after the larval form of the Mexican bean beetle, which aren't as they're not as hard, you know, they're more squishy and soft, so our, our natural enemies can get to them easier. But definitely our big generalist predators like our mantids or robber flies could take care of them easily. So again, the trick is to have a diverse community of insects, including natural enemies. So you have sort of a multi-pronged approach, lots of different insects that can take care of different um, pest insects at their different life stages. What is the wasp that tries to dig a hole into the wood of my front porch? I found a wasp flying around with about 20 small holes in the wood. Well, I can't say without seeing what it is. Um, you know, it could potentially be a carpenter bee. That's sort of the first thing that comes to mind. They're really common um, around this area. I mean, they're common in general, but they're gonna be sort of digging out holes in, in your, deck in your side and whatever. Um, if you have pictures of it, send them to the extension email and I can identify it then, yeah. Great. Um, in addition to planting more wildflowers, how do I get more ladybugs into my vegetable garden? Mm. Definitely planting flowers is a good way to get them in. And then some of the other things that we talked about. So um, having different natural materials in the landscape where they can overwinter, they can reproduce. Um, 
you know, these strategies are general strategies that are going to are gonna attract a lot of natural enemies to your landscape. Like there's no one thing that's going to attract just lady beetles. Um, but again, you have to have some pests for them to eat. So if you have a vegetable garden, I'm sure you're going to have stuff like aphids, uh, white flies, things like that. So there should be no problem there. But if we can sort of boost the diversity of natural materials and flower resources and water resources in the garden that will definitely attract more lady beetles and other natural enemies. Yeah, and some gardening supply centers actually sell in a refrigerated case ladybugs mm -hmm. and beneficial nematodes. So that would be another thought, you know, to consider if you don't attract them naturally. Yeah. Um, how do you tell the difference between a tachnid, a fly and a house fly? Oh gosh, <laughs> I can't say right off the top of my head. There are some morphological characteristics, the way that it looks, that would, you could definitely tell a tachinid from a house fly, which are muskids. Um, I, I was never super good at identifying flies. They are a difficult group to identify. So I can't say off the top of my head, but there are definitely resources online if you want to look into that. A good one is the website bugguide.net. If anybody's inter interested in identifying insects, that is the website for you, bugguide.net. It's sort of um, a crowdsourced website, community website where people um, upload photos of insects and then the admins sort of um, group them taxonomically. So it's, it's really good for entomologists and for everyday folks. So I would go on there, look at the family's muscidae, M-U-S-C-I-D-A-E, those are house flies, and then look at tachinidae and just see if you can see any big differences. Okay, one participant writes, I am a beekeeper. Any tips for protecting honeybees from joro spiders other than just manually killing and destroying webs of joro spiders? Oh gosh, well, you know, as, as many of you know, Joros have been introduced to Georgia and have really proliferated in the last couple of years. So we don't have a lot of good tools for Joros right now. There, I would say individually destroying the webs is your best bet right now, especially getting started early in the season. Um, as far as protecting your hives physically, I don't know. You would know better than me what what sort of technology, I guess, in different hive designs are out there that would keep them safer. But there are some insecticide options as well if you can get them far away enough from your hives. Um, but honestly, I think manually killing them is your best bet right now. Um, yeah, we just don't have a lot of information on Jorah management yet. Um, how does one combat hammerhead worms? I just found out about hammerhead worms like two months ago. So I don't know. Um, that would be something to look in our Georgia Pest Management Handbook. If you Google UGA Georgia Pest Management Handbook um, and go to the Home and Garden section, there are every, ch the, every chapter is on there where you can actually look at the PDF and that will tell you all of the cultural and physical methods you can use for all pests in Georgia and the chemicals that are available and that are effective. So honestly, I just found out about hammerhead worms um, because somebody called into the office about them. So I, I don't know anything about them yet. Are nematodes effective in eating ground larvae of true bugs? So there are entomopathogenic nematodes. Those are nematodes that infect insects. They're not gonna infect plants. Um, whether there are species out there that are specifically, specific controls to true bugs, I'm not sure. I would have to look into that as well. Um, but in general, entomopathogenic nematodes are excellent controls of insects because like our parasitoids, they're super specialized to their hosts. So they're going to pose no threat whatsoever to humans. They're non-toxic to any other organism except for the target insect. Um, usually they're not going to sell species of nematodes or other biological controls that are like 
going to infect like only one species of insect. So I would guess that there probably are some out there that will be good for true bugs. Yeah, but I can't say for sure. What do you do about excessive pill bugs? Pill bugs, um, yeah, pill bugs are not insects, actually, they're isopods, but you'll often find them like underneath of your uh, planters and places that are moist. So I don't know where you're seeing them exactly, but I can assume that it's in a moist area. In general, they're decomposers, and so they're good for our environment. Um, if you have them in your garden, I would say you're doing something right because they're breaking down um, plant material and creating good compost for you. I wouldn't be worried about them. Um, if you're seeing them like underneath of planters when you pick up a planter or something, I think you just have to keep planters sort of in an organized area and keep things clean. But in general, I wouldn't worry about them. If, you, if we have decomposers in the landscape, I think that's really great. Are puddling stations for butterflies also useful water sources? Yes, absolutely. So not just our pollinators are gonna use them. And like I talked about, there's a lot of overlap between our pollinators and our natural enemies because when our natural enemies are out there using these floral resources, these alternative food sources, they unwittingly become pollinators. So there's a ton of crossover. Um, it's hard to extract one from the other. And so when we put out puddling stations for butterflies, we're also going to get honeybees. We're going to get native bees. We're going to get wasps. We're going to get all types of cool stuff that are using that water resource. Um, my only caveat is make sure that you're cleaning out that water and changing the water out on a regular basis just to keep mosquito larvae out of there. Um, I guess it's probably recommended to like bleach it every once in a while. You know, it's the same with a bird bath. You just want to keep it clean so there's not like pathogen buildup in there and you're not creating a breeding environment for mosquitoes. But yeah, it, it, it's great to provide a puddling station or a bird bath, something like that. Okay, well, Gabrielle, uh, this is not the last question, but I, de I definitely think you planted a seed in your presentation because somebody writes, so yellow jackets are pollinators. Is there anything else that is good about them? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, they are pollinators and they're predators. You know, so we mostly see them when they're buzzing around the Coke can when you're trying to have a picnic. Um, and that's because they're trying to get that quick boost of sugar so they can go out there and and collect caterpillars and other prey to take back to their ground nests. Um, so yes, they're pollinators and they're natural enemies and they're generalists. So they're out there grabbing stuff like aphids, caterpillars, all types of pests that are in the landscape. We just happen to interact with, with them in a negative way because they're building nests close to our houses. They're buzzing around the picnic. Um, in general, they're not gonna like they're not going to sting you for no reason. Um, this is sort of true of all wasps. I don't want to get off on a huge tangent here, but wasps will sting you if they get squeezed in between two places. So like if you accidentally like put your elbow down on one on a table, it's going to sting you. But, you know, it is annoying to have them buzzing around you when you're trying to like enjoy yourself outside, but in general they're just trying to get to these food resources so they can keep, you know, hunting in the landscape to take that, that prey back to their young in the nest. Uh, wasps, wasps are building nests in my bluebird boxes. Is there a way to discourage them? I don't know if there's a way to deter them really. Um, the only thing I can think of is to put some other sort of resources in the landscape where they can nest. So I can't say what kind of wasps they are, but you know, by increasing the sort of diversity of natural materials, like we talked about, leaving woody stems in the landscape over the winter, maybe creating other cavities, like I don't know how big your property is, but if you can leave down trees or logs or snags, which are dead trees that are still standing, um, any sort of cavities that are similar, sort of, to your bluebird boxes, 
you know, those are suitable nesting sites as well. So maybe increasing the other suitable nesting sites might help. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think if anybody has social wasps that are creating these nests that are a problem, you can take care of them, but I would by removing them, but I would do it early, early in the season when they're really small or do it early in the morning before they've had a chance to warm up, you know, like by nest laying out on rocks and, and warming up and things, um, or just hire a professional to take care of them. Um, you know, if, if wasps are nesting in an area of your landscape that it's not bothering you, I would just leave them alone because they're providing this predation, they're providing pollination services. But by all means, if they're in an area close to your home that is bothering you or it's a risk to you or your family, you should take care of it. It's just, that's your decision. But, you know, maybe plant, create some more bird boxes um, around your landscape. I don't, that's the best answer I can give, I think. We have a number of comments uh, in the uh, in the Q and A about commenting on spraying to control mosquitoes. What impact does mosquito spray services have on beneficial insects? S communicating to the general public about controlling the spray if they're going to spray. Can you speak about that at all, Gab Gabrielle? Sure. Um, it just depends on the products that are being sprayed. Some products are specific to mosquitoes or to flies. Mosquitoes are flies. Um, so they might not be affecting other types of insects. Some are what we consider broad spectrum. So they will affect other insects. Ideally, um, I mean, technically people that are spraying these uh, mosquito sprays are licensed with a pesticide license from Georgia Department of Ag. And these the test to get that license is tough. I have one myself and it's not easy to pass that test. And they go over safe ways to spray. So there are ways to spray that minimize impact to pollinators and natural enemies. There are times of year and times of day that you can spray that minimize that risk. Um, also, you know, people shouldn't be spraying on a windy day when there's any risk of drift off target. So off of the site where they're, they're meaning to apply the spray. Um, that doesn't mean that things don't happen and people don't spray incorrectly off label um, in ways that can be harmful. But if you are somebody who's hiring a landscape company that's spraying, just make sure you do some due diligence and make sure that those are reliable applicators. Um, that's really the best you can do. I mean, there's not that much you can do about what your neighbor is doing. Um, if you want to try to educate them or share some resources with them about um, natural enemies and pesticide safety, that would be great. Um, but there are ways to apply these chemicals safely. It just depends on whether whether people are really doing that. And I think that goes to the company and the company's policies and who their employees are. What are your thoughts on using the smallest living predators like bacteria to kill grubs? I think a common one is called BT. Yes. Okay, so BT is excellent. BT is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacterium that infects caterpillars. Um, BT is an excellent product for caterpillars because it only infects caterpillars. It's not going to infect any other insects, any other animals, you, nobody else. Um, so BT is a great product. The product that's for Japanese beetle grubs and other white grubs is called BP, Bacillus papillae, and it's also called milky spore. So if you see milky spore around, that's that product. And just like BT is really specific to caterpillars, which are um, butterfly and moth larvae, BP is really sp is specific, specific only to beetles, beetle grubs, um, which are beetle larvae. So yeah, it's a great product. I would encourage anybody to use BT. Again, it's not going to do anything to other insect groups that aren't caterpillars in the case of BT or beetle grubs in the case of BT. 
Okay, um, let's see. Uh, can you tell us more about the tomato hornworm or how to get rid of it? They are asked, uh, we are asked so much about it. Yeah, so BT is a great product for tomato hornworm. Um, you know, if you wanna go the, the biological control natural enemy route, you know, increase doing all of these activities that we talked about um, to increase natural enemies will help control your tomato hornworms. I know like one tomato hornworm can take out a lot of leaf material in a short amount of time. So really one of the best controls for tomato hornworms is hand picking them. Um, if you have chickens or you have know somebody with chickens, chickens love them. You can toss them into the chicken coop and they go absolutely crazy. You can toss them into the woods. Um, you can step on them. They're really big, so I probably wouldn't, but hand picking them is really easy because they're so big and you don't get a ton in one area. Um, but I mean, there are there are chemicals that will control them as well. And I think BT is a great is a great product for that. Okay, I'm looking at the clock and looking, we have a number of more questions. So I'm just gonna filter through to the, the most topical ones. I spray soapy water on my veggie plants when I see aphids. Is this dangerous to the predators that I need? That is a really good question. Um, no, it shouldn't be. Um, but just some tips about spraying soapy water. You wanna use um, like a Castile soap. So not really a detergent like dish detergent. Um, Castile soap is really good because when you dilute it, you want to have one quart of water to one tablespoon of Castile soap. Um, fill up your spray bottle with water before you put the Castile soap in. <laughs> I learned this the hard way. If you put the soap in first, it'll just all come out of the bottle. Anyways, um, Castile soap is better because a detergent sometimes can harm the cuticle of your plant. So you can get some um, issues on the plant, sort of burning the plant, essentially, if you use like dish soap, not always, but it can happen. Um, the thing about soapy water is it's a contact insecticide. Yes, it is. Technically, it's an insecticide because it's killing insects. Um, but so when you spray it, you have to get it onto the insect that it's gonna, that you're trying to target. And it's really only good for soft bodied insects. So things like um, unarmored scales, there are different groups of scales, but our non-armored scales, our soft scales, it'll affect aphids, white flies, um, thrips probably, um, things like that that are really small tend to be in large numbers, but you really wanna douse that plant, get it in the area where you know that those insects are, get it on the undersides of the leaves, get it on the stems. And then you wanna do that like once a day or every couple days for like three or four days in a row. And that's because you have to actually spray the insect. If you just spray the plants and the insect walks on it later, nothing's gonna happen. It only happens on contact. So. You know, when you make that first spray on day one, you might take out like 30% of the insects because that's some of the others are hiding under the leaves or hiding in a crevice. Then the next day you're gonna take out like 30% more. And so then you'll really get a handle on it, but it's not gonna work as a preventative spray. Um, yeah, but I do that on my house plants. It's great for mites as well, but just really douse the plant and see if you can get it onto the insects as best as possible. Um, on that topic, what is the ratio of water to Castile soap again? It's one quart of water to one tablespoon of Castile soap. Okay. Um, somebody's asking how often or do you need to send in a soil sample uh, to help the insects? Is this a thing to worry about? No, not really. Um, I think by testing your soil, you're making sure that it's going to be supportive of the plants that you're putting in. So a healthy plant in general is going to be more resistant and more tolerant of pests, which are going to be there no matter what. Like I said earlier, you can't completely nuke all pests. It's not possible. Um, but if we can prep the soil for whatever plants we're going to put in, whether it's a vegetable garden or they are perennial flowering plants or you're putting in a tree, if we can get that soil prepped in terms of soil nutrients, 
texture, et cetera, then we're going to have a healthier plant in general that's going to withstand um, issues from pests a lot better. Like just like when we are not getting the things that we need, if we're underslept, if we're not eating well, we're going to get sick more easily than if we're exercising, we're eating fruits and vegetables, you know, whatever. Um, it's the same with plants. So we want to give them what they need. And that's the benefit of doing the soil test is so that you can see, is my plant getting what it needs from the soil? So in terms of actually supporting natural enemies or insects, the, the soil tests, our basic soil tests aren't, they're not going to tell you anything really. Okay, um, let's see. Is there any product which, uh, which is a spray that can kill flies instead of killing good insects? insects? It depends what, what you want to control them on. So what kind of plants you want to control them on um, and what type of flies they are. So, you know, I talked about a number of flies that are natural enemies and are really helpful for us. Flies are great pollinators. Um, you know, it, it kind of just depends on a few different factors. So if you want to, I can work with this person uh, more individually, just shoot me an email and we can, we can talk about why you want to control them, what's going on, and then we can probably come to a solution. Okay. And I think this is the last, uh, rel most relevant question, I, I think. Um, can you speak about gnats and then how do you get rid of gnats? Yes. Um, most of the questions I get about gnats are inside the home and usually they're fungus gnats. So I hope that's what this person is talking about. Um, if you're getting fungus gnats coming out of your house plants, it's a watering issue. Your, so your house plant soil is staying too moist. Um, fungus gnats, the larvae live in the soil and they feed on fungi that live in the soil as well, that only proliferate in moist conditions. So if you have fungus gnats in your house plants, it means you're watering too much. Just cut back your watering until at least the top inch or inch and a half or two inches is dry and then water again. And that'll at least like cut down the, that environment that the, the fungus gnat larvae need to have in order to come out as adults. If this person is talking about in the landscape, um, it's probably a moisture issue as well. You know, it could be that you have some standing water somewhere, or you have a moist area of your yard where they're developing. Um, there are different solutions for that. You know, you can, you can sort of redo your landscape. Um, you can build a water garden. You can maybe do some of these techniques to attract natural enemies that'll be, you know, like robber flies flying around eating um, aerial pests and dragonflies and damselflies are flying around eating stuff like mosquitoes. So that's sort of my best answer, I think. All right, Gabrielle, that is it. Uh, thank you so much. I do want to make a comment. Somebody's commenting here, and I agree, actually, because I've done some research on hammerhead worms and these jumping worms that look like little snakes. Okay. Do, not cut, do not cut them as they will multiply almost immediately. Place the worms in a baggie with salt to kill them. Um, and uh, so that I just wanted to provide that a little additional inf information on the topic of hammerhead worms that came up earlier. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, I, had, I definitely have some more reading to do on that topic. And um, I just want to thank everybody for watching and for your great questions. And I hope that that was helpful. Um, you're going to get a survey as soon as this uh, the talk ends. Please fill out the survey. That is super, super helpful for us to know what programming is good for you. And so we can tailor that program to your need, that programming to your needs as well. And I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity and thank the North Fulton Master Gardeners as well.